Hello, BookTube. Well, it's that melancholy moment. It's the last mail haul of the week. A cold and windy day here in Boston at the very end of April. Uh, uh, but we have three packages here, and two of them are boxes, so there may be something good in here. Uh, we'll do the first one, the one that isn't a box, one of these white envelopes here, to start with, and then we'll move on to the boxes. Boxes usually mean big finished copies, and big finished copies are good. Uh, okay, uh, this is a finished copy. Uh, probably comes out on May 7th. Oh no, April 30th. Good lord. It's right around the corner. Uh, this is by Eric Hazeltine, and it's called The Spy in Moscow Station. A counter-spy's hunt for a deadly Cold War threat. Oh, I'm always up for a book like this. Always. Uh, especially since it's right around the corner. I, I could uh, read it right now, as soon as I finish this video. Uh, in the late 1970s, the National Security Agency still did not officially exist. Those in the know referred to it dryly as the No Such Agency, NSA. Uh, when NSA engineer Charles... Gandhi filed for a visa to visit Moscow. Did the Russian foreign ministry assert with confidence that he was a spy? Outsmarting honey traps and encouraging deep enough and encroaching deep enough into enemy territory to perform complicated technical investigations, Gandhi accomplished his mission in Russia but discovered more than state and CIA wanted him to know. <laughs> well, this is all real. It's all a true story. Uh, and in this book, uh, the author, who is a former director of research at the NSA and associate director of national intelligence in charge of science and technology for the U.S. intelligence community, uh, tells a of a time when, much like today, Russian spycraft had proven itself far beyond the best technology the U.S. had to offer. The perils of American arrogance mixed with bureaucratic infighting left the country unspeakably vulnerable to ultra-sophisticated Russian electronic surveillance and espionage. So this is going to be the story of that from, from when was it? Back in the late 1970s. Of course, I disagree, of course, with that assertion. That, that assertion, uh, the, the fundamental assertion here, Russian spycraft has proved itself far beyond the best technology had that U.S., uh, the, far beyond the best technology the U.S. had to offer is completely untrue. <laughs> completely untrue. There is, there is nothing in Russian espionage, for instance, today in 2019 that is anywhere near beyond the capabilities of, of American technical expertise. It's not the capabilities, it's the will. It's the will to act. Uh, but even so, a, a, a real-life spy story, I just love them. I, I have a, a strong sweet tooth for them. And this is April 30th, so this is right around the corner. Uh, this is the April 30th. is today, isn't it? Or tomorrow? Uh, I, I uh, gobble up. Real Life Spy Stories, The Man with the Poison Gun. What a book that was, oh boy. Don't miss it. Uh, by Sergei Ploki, the, the guy who did the, just recently did History of uh, Chernobyl. Uh, the Man with the Poison Gun was terrific. I, it probably It's probably out in paperback by now, and just the publisher has just not sent me a copy of the paperback. But if I remember, I will try and find my review of the book, because it's another thrill, real life spy thriller that is just great. Uh, and this... This is right up, right along those same lines. Fantastic. Okay, great start. Now we'll move on to the first of the boxes. Uh, let's see what this thing is. Walking Frida outside in full winter gear. Knit hat, knit gloves, winter coat. In, in, with one day left in April. Oh, what are you doing? What are you doing up here? Huh? You want this box? You can't have any of the plastic. Do you have the box? The box is too much for a little bean like you. Why don't you just stick with your... Oh, oh, fantastic. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I actually read this, and it was really good. And it, it's a, a nonfiction book that gets better as it goes along. The further along in its story it goes, the better it gets. Uh, which, you know, maybe, if I were being crabby, my, I'm, that might suggest to me that the authors probably didn't write the right book. Uh, but it doesn't matter, because it's good even at the beginning. Uh, I don't know if we saw it on this channel, but this is the finished copy, and I, I can recommend it. It's a it's a bit on the technical side, but the author the the authors take you well in hand. So you, if if it wasn't too technical for me, it's not going to be too technical for you. This is called bored, lonely, angry, stupid, uh, changing feelings about technology from the telegraph to Twitter. You see, bored, lonely, angry Twitter have their their accompanying emojis. Oh. <laughs> uh, this wide-ranging account of our emotional responses to technology, from the telegram to Instagram, shows that technology changes not only how we feel, but what our feelings mean. 
uh, today, many of us worry that modern technology is changing our personalities. <clears throat> I don't know that I would say that's true. What I think modern technology is doing is allowing us to know instantly the personalities of everyone, which you, you didn't know before. You had There were multiple fo social filters. But if you put somebody online, on social media, a social media forum of some kind, and you give them a reasonable protect protection of anonymity, you see instantly what they're like. <laughs> and you didn't see that before. Uh, but maybe it is changing personalities. I don't know. What about you? you those of you who, who maybe are ancient enough to, to remember a time before social media, did this technology, this latest technology, smart technology, has that changed your personality? Has it made you uh, less tolerant? Less patient? <laughs> Baby, did you lose your toy? You did. Oh, God, Frida, I swear. <clears throat> I gave her a rawhide chewy toy, uh, and it's it's big and tough. It's supposed to last a little dog like her forever, and instead she just goes at it with a will. So she had most of it gone, and now she has just the dead head. She has the one knob at the end of it. That's all that's left. And when she gets to that point, always, every time, her whole life, she when she has the little knob that's just a ball that fits in her mouth, she flings it <laughs> in all directions. And it invariably goes where she cannot retrieve it, and then I have to retrieve it for her. With her looking at me like, oh, please, what's going on? <laughs> anyway, anyway, uh, is social media making us angry? Again, I don't think it is. I think it reveals how angry people are, but uh, maybe it does. Uh, certainly, I know lots of people on social media who have no control at all. They don't exercise any control whatsoever. We even see it in the quiet backwater of BookTube. Every once in a great while, happens on my channel, probably happens on yours as well, every once in a great while you'll get somebody who will leave a comment of a type they would never in a million years say to your face. That, that, that's that got to be an effect of technology, I would assume. Uh, is Facebook making us lonely? Uh, is Google making us stupid? Uh, have we become a nation of selfie-taking narcissists? Are we unable to tolerate boredom? Have we lost the capacity to pay attention? Are we still capable of awe? Such questions abound in the popular press, yet they lack a clear sense of the past. And this book recounts their untold story, placing contemporary Americans' relationship with technology in historical perspective, from the telegraph to Twitter. Uh, and those are all great questions, and you notice that they, they become, if those questions are the ones overhanging this book, and they are, uh, then the book is going to be, like I mentioned, the book is going to get more relevant and more pointed and more fleshed out the further along it goes. Because a lot of those questions that we just heard don't apply to cinematography, to early cinematography. They don't. A lot of those questions that we heard don't apply to the telephone out in the hall or down at the post office. Uh, so really, it's, it's the, this boom in smart technology that we have all seen in our lifetime. That is, that is, I think, what the book is. There's certainly, the, that's the parts, those are the parts of the book that are the strongest. But the, the whole thing is really good. The whole thing is, well, a, a meditation on modern technology, well worth your time to read. And it comes out on the 1st of May. Um, from, uh, did I mention? Harvard? It's Harvard, yes. Harvard University Press. Okay, so two finished copies of two nonfiction works in a row, both of them very much worth your time. And now we'll do the last one. This is the, the second of the two boxes, and then we'll be done with the mail for the week fairly good week for mail. Uh, good week for me as well in terms of you. I think there was only one mail haul that I opened off camera. All the rest of it I think I did. Uh, so let's see. This one did not come willingly. <laughs> so, uh, and it's another, oh my, it's another great big thing from, uh, from Harvard University Press. Oh no baby, don't, don't do the plastic. You can't have the plastic. Be down the hatch before I could even stop you. Uh, Okay, this also comes out in May. I have a feeling, just to call it a guess, that one of you is the more ideal reader for this thing than I am. This is by Robert Brandom, and it is called A Spirit of Trust, Reading Hegel's Phenomenology. Look at the size of this thing. All about Hegel. All about one book. Reading one book by Hegel. Although, that is a really nice cover. It's like a swarm of birds made by individual birds into a bigger bird. Uh, I don't know how much we're going to get out of reading about this thing. This is a, this is for a philosophy walk. Uh, Forty years in the making. Good Lord. This long-awaited reinterpretation of Hegel's phenomenology of spirit is a landmark contribution to philosophy by one of the world's best-known and most influential philosophers. 
In this much-anticipated work, Robert Brandom presents a completely new retelling of the romantic rationalist adventure of ideas that is Hegel's classic. Connecting analytic, continental, and historical traditions, Brandom shows how dominant modes of thought in contemporary philosophy are challenged by Hegel. Uh, and this also comes out in the first, you know, on the first of May. That is the release date. I don't think a book like this will have a strong embargo, so this might be in your stores already. Uh, okay, then. All right, so this is the author is a distinguished professor of philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh and a fellow of both the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the British Academy. And I guess this is, uh, in philosophy circles, a long-awaited book. I do not travel in philosophy circles, so I wouldn't know. Uh, but it's huge. It's a... Uh, it's over 800 pages, uh, all about Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. So I need to uh, go to that bookshelf uh, behind me and find the Penguin Classic of Hegel uh, and reread it, obviously, before I get to this thing. <laughs> but uh, it's clearly not for me anyway. Uh, it's going to cause joy to some people. Uh, but anyway, so we have A Spirit of Trust, an 800-page book about Hegel, one book by Hegel. We have Bored, Lonely, Angry, Stupid about what technology is doing to humans and what it has been doing in the relatively brief time, one lifetime of a human being, of a, a very old human being, but one lifetime has seen all of these innovations. And in recent times, in the last 30 years, the innovations have come piled on top of each other. Uh, so uh, it, uh, the book feel, has the feel, I, I don't think the authors really intended it, I'm not sure that it's completely inevitable, that it's completely avoidable. I, I, think, I don't think the authors really intended for the book to have a gathering momentum as it goes along, but it definitely does. <laughs> it definitely does. Readers of this book are not going to be interested in how people reacted to the telegram. <laughs> I mean, the authors do an interesting job, but still. Uh, and then a spy, the spy in Moscow Station, uh, Soviet and intelligence and counterintelligence in the late 1970s. How great. I kind of wish, of course, it's not fair to the philosophy wonks out there, but I kind of wish this were this size. <laughs> but that's okay. It's a nice, solid, non-fiction mail haul to end out the mail hauls of the week. So I'm going to uh, I'm gonna wrap this up for now and clean up the floor. Uh, but I will be back. Thank you, book two.